both hostile situations such as a coup d'etat to more amicable transformations such as a king seceding from the throne and another king ascending in his place. There is a civic solution to the problem. Well, the first time I became aware that there was a civic solution to the problem is when Noble Jew Ali said that I started a civics organization. The contradiction that made me raise an eyebrow is asked, why are they patterning it now as if it's a religion? Right? So that took me back to Albert Pike's The Morals and the Dogma. Because under the civics, there's no dogma involved because you're unraveling the legal means. But if you can get them to chase the dogma, they won't really take the civics serious enough in order to exercise a superior jurisdiction to overthrow the imposters on the land because the only way you can do it is to go back to your original system. Your original system is a matriarchal system based off the oral decree of the chieftains in agreement across the land that which benefits the most amount of people from each of the clans. Wouldn't there be a necessity really to go back to the original system in doing that? Wouldn't it be a necessity of shedding ourselves or devoiding, divorcing ourselves of all the religious attachments, the dogma that we've taken on to be, you know, Christians and be, to be, you know, well, this denomination that I mean, from a standpoint of when, when we realize that those things were were actually um, put in place to put us under subjection. Right, so so would we have to shed those in order to get back to the original? Um, at this point of the um, discovery process for the collective, they can use whatever path of spiritual development they choose to as long as they don't turn the blind eye to the other paths, right? And this is where the polarization comes out, as Noble Drew Ali called it, as a religious controversy. We are, remember, we are um, allopathic, and we are naturopathic first, right? That means that all things have to go back to a stasis, which is the state of balance. Right. So when you abruptly tell somebody who's been doing who's been in the church for 75 years, hey, drop that some garbage. The shock to their system cause a, could call a healing crisis to a significant degree to make them lose their mind. If you go back to Elijah Muhammad, he said, if you wake him up too soon, you are driving crazy. And that's why he used to keep saying, make it plain enough for a baby to understand it. So right. what are we trying to get folks that are steeped in any any level of dogma to understand? You know, from what my my where I come from, having been a pastor for you know ten years mm -hmm. and seeing you know the good and the 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 ugly. You know, you see you see it all and and in between. Okay, so but, let's let's you yeah. I mean, I'm saying indoctrination um, and like you mentioned earlier, twelve step program. And the various, all of these things were are, were things that that affect the mind of people. Fear, fear, reverence, so that you don't think outside the box. Um, having to reverence something that is unseen while ignoring the obvious inside of yourself. All of those things, to me, have been designed to not allow us to get back to the natural. I mean, you're saying, I know, don't, and I do know what you mean about not waking up folks too soon. I mean, or not all of a sudden. Although for my personal awakening, it hit me like a ton of bricks when I was in a service and all of a sudden I was snatched out of it in an in, 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 in out-of-body experience. And the next day, you know, I'm up in, in the pulpit preaching my swan song because right after that, I'm, you know, everybody's gone because now I'm the like you say crazy. You know, they say about you, I was crazy. But for me, maybe that was the way it had to happen. And but for the masses, when you to get critical mass. And nothing really happens, I, I don't think, until you get enough minds thinking the same. So in your going through, I want to go back to your dark night of the soul before you get too forward, because you kind of skipped over. You said, when I came out of prison in 2008, but what about those years prior to 2008? What, how about the time when you were, you know, you, you ended up apparently veering from 
what Big Mama was saying because you were running off. Maybe you were running from your calling. But in that uh, captured, if you will, situation, what happened to you there? What 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 were you doing during those times? So when I first got uh, caught up and locked up, I remember the voice of the sisters that I used to hear give words of wisdom. I was in Cook County Jail. I was in there. I was like on my second or third day in there. And um, a, man, a bald head guy named Hawk came with a sister. I can't remember her name. And they were actually Christians. But she wasn't coming with the dogma. She was coming with raw common sense. And one of the things she said was well, that stuck with me. And she said, some of y'all finna get a lot of time. She said, but don't worry about that. You can't stop that. Put yourself in. There is no escape, even if you want to. She said, but the best thing that you can do is don't let them take the time from you. Use the time. Learn everything you can while you're in there. You don't need no degree, but get your Ph.D., and I'm sitting there and I'm like, that makes so much sense. So this, if, if I apply this to my prison term, if I get time out of this and I apply what she's saying, when I get out of prison, I can have the knowledge of a professor at a university in the amount of time that I'm about to get that I don't know I'm about to get this much time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in the, um, in they gave me 18 to 50 years in prison right and during my um my cook county stint well it was like a year and a half i end up coming across i just started realizing that all of the um most potent members of our our community the organic indigenous people was in these cages right and I got introduced by different ones, by different people. Like um, this, uh, uh, the leader of the Maniac Disciples, name is Ferg. I met uh, my cousin, introduced me to him on our way to court, right? Then in the bullpen, it was some BGs, black, what they call black gangsters, that was high ranking and he introduced me to them, right? I had a vice lord um, introduced me to Willie Lord. And it was kind of odd to me when he done that because um, we in, we walking through the day room, he calling me over there where his chief at to introduce me to his chief. But he told me before he, he said, man, I want to introduce you to Willie Lord. Right? And I was like, okay. And because we was watching him on the news get arrested. <laughs> And when he got in there, he was downstairs in the, um, in a cell in a cell block called ABO in Division One. So he came up on a visit. They brought him up to A One where I was at. And so uh, Lil J, who was a four star league vice lord, he said, "Come here, man. I want you to meet somebody." And he walked over. He said, "Stay right here." So I'm standing on the other side of the day room, and he went and said a couple words to Willie Lord, and he waved me over there. He said. He said, hey, Lord, I want you to meet him, man. And he told me who I was, his name, Rod. And back then, I was uh, studying with a Nation of Islam guy named Everett X, who was teaching me about, uh, now this is all within the first year of being locked up. But he was teaching me Nation of Islam doctrine. And um, they was calling me Rod X, right? But they was calling me that, like, uh, a nickname because I hang out with the Nation of Islam guy all the time, but they all knew that I was under the GD banner. And so when he introduced me to Willie Lord, the whole day room stopped talking and they looking. And what he said caught my attention. He said, hey, Lord, this one right here, this is the one. I don't know what that shit mean. <laughs> right? And he shook my hand and he says, it's good to meet you, young brother. He said, stay on the straight and narrow. That's all he said. He didn't give me no conversation. Um, he didn't, we didn't go into nothing. We just greeted each other, but he told me to stay on the straight and narrow. I know what that means from 
church. And I know what that means from every. And we discussed it. Right? Staying on the straight and narrow means walk straight. Right? Don't let these people push you off your path. Mm -hmm. Now, when Everett X had to leave, he went to uh, went upstate. And the last thing I told him, I was like, man, this is a big deal. I don't know if I could do it. He looked at me and, and I could see the Elijah Muhammad in his face when he started smiling. And he said, oh, you got this. And then he recited the story of Hiram Abiff. And he said, you're going to need that later. And then I heard Farrakhan go over the story of Hiram Abiff. Right? And when I started studying the story, after I got out of prison, I started seeing certain events unfolding that was unnerving to me because this was starting to tell me there's a Masonic connection to my birthright. So now I have to study the lodges deeper than I already have because I was going through a secret society investigation while I was studying with the Nuwabians in prison. So we was going through, well, I was going through each secret society reading entire text on them where Malachi gave a, had a book out called Secret Societies Unmasked where he got a little part about all of them. So I started to get books from their perspective about their doctrine, right? But it became more enhanced when I came home, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so during the course of these years, normally my temperament, I would have been, um, I would have what they call ready to ride. I was always ready to ride, but it had to be one condition. I got to be right. The only reason why I feel like that is because my mama used to tell me when I was little that don't start nothing and you're going to always win it. You got to always be in the right. So I don't start nothing, but I sure finish it. I don't got no problem finishing it. And um, I remember my father saying that a man always moves straight. He said, man, don't do all that funny, swervy, shifty stuff. That's not how I'm, he was talking to his friends in our garage. So this was one of my lessons on being a man from my father that really impacted my life because I always came at people straight. And mama said, respect those who respect you. But you got to give respect to get respect. That means if I'm at your house, in order for me to get respect at your house, I got to first give you respect. I got to come in peace in order to receive peace and the blessing up on arrival. So everywhere I went, I held that in the forefront of my mind and everybody that I met, I met them from a level of respect and it was returned. And this is why as a uh, GD, I'm over in Motown on 50th in May, living in the complex in the all stone neighborhood. The only folks um, is on 50th place, right? So I gave them their respect because that's their land. I already know to honor them on their land and give them they due respect. And they drew an attachment to me from being respectable and being respectful of their place. So I, I, I ran into a couple of confrontations with some of the stones, but it was always resolved in a matter of respect. So I didn't ever have a problem with stones and vice lords being stones and vice lords. I didn't never see them as enemies because I knew we had the same enemies. So I didn't know how to categorize what I'm looking at, but I know that whoever it is that's infiltrating stones and vice lords is the same people infiltrating the GDs. I understand the, the, the literature of the GDs and I understand the literature that I was given by vice lords and I understand the literature that I was given orally by stones and crypts and bloods. And I'm seeing a pattern that this is the behavior that's ancient on the land. If this behavior is ancient on the land, I got to see it somewhere else. Here, lo and behold, it emerges. It's the structure of the nation of Islam. It's the structure of the 5% nation. It's the structure of um, Yahweh ben Yahweh's Hebrew Israelites. It's a repeating pattern. It's a tribal structure from the top to the bottom. How we used to perform in the old ways where we was in all parts of the land, but we never had conflicts with people on their portion of the land. 
because we understood that who we are is predicated up on honoring those in respect when you're in a house. You can't come in somebody's house and just superimpose your will. So whoever the imposter is, is the ones who came in our house and is doing what we don't normally do. Makes sense. <laughs> so when I start tracing it back, I end up with the 32 degree Scottish right, morals and dogma, George Washington, Albert Pike, um, um, the guy that started the uh, Illuminati, Adam Whiteshaw. Mm. <clears throat> Three different personas of the same person. But most people can't see the pattern. I couldn't even, I couldn't see the pattern originally until I was studying forensic profiling and the mechanics of it. And I wanted to do a forensic profile on the biblical guy character, which turned out horrible, by the way. <coughs> turned out horrible. Turns out that he's a sociopathic narcissist, early bedwetter, who has mama issues and daddy issues and don't know his own identity and sexuality, who feels that he should be held in superiority to other people just because uh, who he is where other people become less than him. This biblical God character can't be no God. He got to be some kind of mortal masquerading as a God through written literature. Because that's not the characteristics of the God form. So that came from a Q&A that I had in Saginaw Correctional Facility with um, some University of Michigan psychologists who came to do a lecture at the prison. And during the course of the lecture, I had asked them, had anybody done a psychological evaluation of the biblical God character because I couldn't find it. And they assured me that as far as they knew, one of them had like 35 years in psychiatry and psychology one was a psychologist for over 45 years. The other one was a psychiatrist for over 40 years. And none of them had heard of anybody having the audacity to do a psychological profile in the last, since it became known on this character from the Bible. Now, with... Boys would listen to you how you would say you know it's time to bring the take the kids out of school so i literally finally did that it was such a struggle so i'm just like waiting now and just having that freedom of being able to talk to my kids and let them know what's going on and getting them prepared things like that yeah because a lot of people don't know what's going on so they really can't tell their children you know so they're just gonna run into a lot of stuff in the blind right how your kid, how your how the babies like being home instead of going to class? Oh, they love, they love it. <laughs> they love it. My son is eleven, my daughter is six, but they are very in tune and like they understand. Look, come say hi to Uncle Rod. <laughs> they was like, they was like, Mom, are you going to go live? I was like, Yeah, I'm going to go live. I'm going to request. Come say hi. Don't say hi. Don't say hi. Don't be shy. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Look at you. You're so cute. Oh, what do you say? Hi. <laughs> yeah, she's like, she's kind of shy still. Yeah. Look, my son just sitting here with his mouth open. Jay, say hi. Say hi. What's up, buddy? Hi. <laughs> how you doing? Hey. <laughs> yeah, so I've been explaining to them how, you know, a lot of things are changing and things are shifting and they are really, they're interested in it and they're in tune and they have their own, you know, input and things like that.
But I'm just like, the more I look at things, like, it just seems like a never ending nightmare sometimes. I'm just like, when is, like, why can't people just see how if we just all come together and, like, just think on one accord? Like, I, it feels like it would just push it forward, you know, and it would be like a bigger change. I don't know. Because I'm literally just sitting here just. So the thing, the last thing we're looking to see is we're looking for the people of uh, Aichi to do a sweet water return ceremony. That means that they got the message, they understand the mission, and they take care of their part of the business. Mm -hmm. So they got a, a Corps of Army Engineers on standby <clears throat> to go and help clean up in the city of um, Port-au-Prince. When they got trash damn near waist deep, they're going to come mm -hmm. through with bull.